This space was downloaded via spacesdown.com. Visit to download your spaces today. Hello, welcome to the Twitter space um, created to discuss Uganda's independence. We shall wait a few minutes and then start. Uh, welcome, Solomon, to the space. Welcome, welcome to the space. Solomon Nabianda will be the, the co-host together with me. My name is Stella Nyanzi. I'm delighted to be here. I recognize the presence of uh, Dr. Chiza Besije. Doctor, I'm going to request you to request for the mic so that we upload you to that panel space as a speaker. Um, I want to thank everybody for coming to join us. We shall wait a few more minutes for the other panelists to start, and then we shall kick off our discussion about what independence means in Uganda today. Solomon Nawianda will um, Solomon Nawianda will briefly, as well as introduce the space. And uh, he is my co-host, Dr. Tisa Vesije. I recognize you have requested for the microphone. You have been uploaded to the space as a speaker. Solomon Nawianda, please request for the microphone again. Dr. Besije, if you will please mute your microphone. Thank you very much. Um, Solomon Nawianda, please request for the microphone after joining the space. And we shall be able to start. My name is Stella Nyanzi. I'm a Ugandan currently living in exile. Uh, I live in Germany. I'm a scholarship holder of the Penn Writers in Germany, Writers in Exile program. We expect two other co-panelists. Honorable Minister Nobat Mao, who accepted our invitation, and uh, Secretary General of National Unity Platform, David Lewis Rubongoya. I want to welcome everybody who kept time. It is now five past eight o'clock, and uh, we shall start the space. So, briefly, this is a space that is created for liberal Ugandans. We believe in freedom of expression. We believe in the right for everybody, irrespective of their gender, their religion, their ethnic group, their political party affiliation, to express themselves freely. And in that regard, I will invite Honorable Nabianda Solomon to briefly introduce himself and introduce the rules of the space, and then we shall start. Solomon, you're welcome. Um, Stella, confirm that you can hear me? Yes, loud and clear. Um, it is actually 13th October 2023. Six minutes past um, 8 p.m. Uganda time. Good afternoon, good morning, and good evening to everyone that is listening into this specific space. This is a space where we get to share and debate and um, uh, have a conversation about the 61, what it means to make 61 years of independence. What exactly has changed? What do we need to change? Is there any change? Or, uh, in fact, if we might interrogate the meaning of the word change, this is what our panelists tonight, like earlier introduced by my host, um, uh, the indomitable Dr. Stella Nyanzi, um, uh, where we shall be hosting um, uh, Dr. Colonel um, uh, Kiza Besige, um, uh, Honorable Mau, and um, uh, David Lewis Rubongoya, the National Unity Platform Secretary General, and we shall follow the following rules. Rule number one, there shall be no disrespect of any um, uh, member on this platform. In case um, uh, you want to disagree or defer from a submission, that should be done respectfully. And in case you do not obey that rule, we shall actually drop you off the space. Secondly, each speaker shall use five minutes to respond to the questions that are going to be asked. Um, uh, Sabah Wandi, David Lewis, Rwongoya, you are welcome. Kindly request for the microphone. Um, each speaker will use um, only five minutes to respond to the questions that are actually going to be um, asked. And um, uh, after, the com after the conversation with the panelists, we shall um, open up um, the conversation to the audience to actually chip in and also give um, uh, their opinion. Right, thank you very much, Solomon. Welcome, David Lewis, Rubongoya, Secretary General of National Unity Platform. I will request that if Honorable Nobat Mao is present, that he may as well request for the microphone. In the meantime, I would like to proceed by asking an uh, introductory question first to the first panelist who showed up on time, Dr. Chiza Besije. I'd like you to briefly introduce yourself, perhaps tell us how old you were at the time of independence, and uh, along with your introduction, in what ways is today's Uganda under Yoweri Kaguta Museveni any better than colonized Uganda under the British? Welcome, Dr. Besije. 
Thank you very much, uh, Stella. I hope you can hear me. Loud and clear. Please proceed. Yes, uh, greetings to everyone, wherever you are joining the space from. Uh, at Independence in 1962, I happen to be one of the few Ugandans now left who is still alive uh, because uh, only 3% of Ugandans were alive at Independence, I think, <laughs> if I'm not wrong in my statistics. And um, at Independence, actually, uh, I was, not, well, I think... Uh, maybe uh, 61 years uh, I was six years by that time and I was in school and uh, I participated in um, march marching on the on the independence day marching for the, with the school band uh, to the grounds where the celebrations were held in my little town of Urukunjiri and I can say without uh, any shade of doubt that even at that young age, one could not escape the air of uh, euphoria, happiness, and the great expectation of uh, wonderful things that uh, were expected to result as uh, uh, from then because of what was this independence uh, occasion, uh, that Uganda was returning to Ugandans uh, from the British and that the British flag actually came down at uh, midnight and that the Ugandan flag, the new flag, was now flying. Uh, so there, there is uh, uh, anybody who was alive, and as I have said, unfortunately, they are now, we are now few left, uh, but everybody who was alive, and certainly those who were older than me must have experienced it much more than I did, the, uh, you know, the great expectation and uh, the, uh, the happiness, uh, the, the The, the joy that was uh, Dr. Chisa Vesija, we seem to be losing you. Can you hear me? But it is wonderful to note that you were six years old and you participated in the school band and you're among the few Ugandans who remember the euphoria of independence, Which um, is, many of us only read about it. Yes, please proceed, Dr. Vesijin. Yes, there was a, a, a sense at that time that one could, you know, have a fairly, uh, uh, you know, expected trajectory in life, that you grow up as a child like we were in school, that you could actually continue to with your school unless you failed the exams, that you would have a reasonable expectation to continue with your school if you are able to pass your exams and that you would go higher in education and that once you got higher education, you are, the quality of life you would expect would correspondingly increase. And in school at that time, uh, we were a mixture of the whole spectrum of our society. You know, uh, in Rukunjiri, we used to have a ruling uh, family we had a chief, we had a chiefdom in Rukunjiri, and the the children from the ruling family were my classmates. Uh, some are still around. Uh, the, the the princes and uh, princesses are still around. We were classmates, and we had those from the poorest homes within our community. They were our classmates. We were all in the same school. We enjoyed the same facilities. We had the same kind of uh, uh, you know, opportunity to progress in education. And actually, uh, generally, kids from poor schools performed extremely well. Some walked very long distances to get to school. They they arrived very early before so those of us who were living around the school. They uh, had to walk those long distances back home. They carried their food in uh, uh, in banana leaves, wrapped in banana leaves for their lunch and things like that. But they performed extremely well in school and some indeed have made it very, very far in life as a result of the transformative effect of that quality education they were able to receive from the colonial administration, uh, which today we live in a country of apathy. There is absolutely no doubt that there is education apathy. There is economic apathy. There is service apathy. So if you are from a poor school, you will go to a school that possibly 
does not have a roof, does not have chairs, does not have, <laughs> you know, a, a regular infrastructure that is crowded with hundreds of other very poor kids and um, uh, that you would expect the greatest majority of those kids to drop out before P7. Uh, because as we all know, about 70% of kids indeed do drop out for lack of anything useful they find in the schools. Those who are from rich schools go to uh, exclusive schools with the best facilities, with the best teachers, with the best opportunity uh, to progress in education and in life. So that is a very stark comparison between what happened before independence and what has eventually happened to our community, our society after independence. Before independence, whatever oppression, whatever lack of opportunity there was, was equally shared among store citizens. After independence, we have developed an apartheid uh, system, an apartheid in all respects, whether it is in the political sphere, whether it is in the economic sphere, whether it is in the services sphere, uh, and, 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 and the rest of it. And, uh, and that injustice, uh, no doubt, has transformed into the kind of uh, uh, d d d discontent that you find in the greatest majority of the people of Uganda and eventually translates into the insecurity because you can never have peace, stability, and sustained progress in an, in a, in an environment of, insecurity, of, of injustice. And it's the injustice now that is the hallmark of our post-independence period. Uh, well, um, thank you so much, um, uh, retired Colonel Dr. Kiza Besige, for those wonderful um, recounts of what independence was or meant to what actually is happening in our country. Now, coming to you, um, uh, Honorable um, David Lewis Rubagoya, um, uh, please briefly introduce yourself and tell us how many years were you when mm -hmm. Uganda obtained its independence? And given your readings of Uganda's colonial history, how does Uganda then define? From the Uganda today. Thank you so much. So back to you, Lewis. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, my name is David Lewis Rubongwe, Secretary General of the National Unity Platform. I'm very humbled to share this space with all of you, but especially to share it with uh, uh, Dr. Besije, who, as you know, we admire so much and uh, appreciate for the role he continues to uh, play in uh, the redemption of our country. I was actually born 26 years after Uganda got independence. So you can imagine that uh, I was, uh, you know, uh, and I think I represent many, many uh, other Ugandans, uh, the vast majority, who did not see independence, uh, uh, or who were not there at the time uh, when Uganda got independent. Um, but um, for, all, for all intents and purposes, I'm, I'm very glad to be alive and to see the Ugandan story. But I also happen to be a constitutional uh, history uh, lecturer, and therefore I've studied the history of uh, uh, this our country. And I can also, from the readings I've made, uh, I can see uh, the euphoria with which many Ugandans received independence and the promise and what many people thought this our country would be uh, after getting independence. And for me, what disappoints me so much is that, uh, you know, when uh, the NRA was in the bush, there's that clip of uh, Otafile talking about why they were fighting. And he was saying that, you know, uh, the uh, white colonialists were replaced by black colonialists. And uh, by that, he met the regimes of the day. And he was talking about the injustice and uh, all the oppression that people are going through. And it is very unfortunate that almost four decades later of the NRM rule, we've had similar challenges right now. And uh, especially, you know, on, on the governance side, because uh, as, as we all know, it's governance that shapes many of these other things that we talk about, be it uh, the economy, education, uh, public services, etc., etc., um, uh, you know, equity uh, in society, uh, inclusive economic development, and all these other things. So it is very unfortunate that uh, when I look at, you know, what our forefathers were struggling uh, to change under the colonial rule, I see that most of uh, what they were fighting is still present with us, you know, and uh, what they were talking about when they were fighting, talking about, uh, you know, the, the black colonialists replacing the white ones, I think they have taken it a notch further, and that's why there's a lot of strife in our society, there's a lot of uh, imbalance, there's a lot of uh, economic strife in this country, uh, but most importantly, that uh, Ugandans are not independent, uh, that they don't have the, the power, they don't. They have not been able to reclaim their country, that uh, our country is still under capture, something that Dr. Vesey has indeed talked about many times, that our country is still under capture of a few, 
uh, you know, a small click controlling resources, a small click controlling uh, uh, the economy, a small click, you know, deciding what or, or choosing to decide what happens in the country. And, and as you know, for example, just uh, uh, while this country was celebrating purportedly the 61st independence anniversary, some of us, myself, Honorable Senyoni and others, spent the day in cells. And why did we spend the day in cells? Because we, we came out and wanted to hold prayers at our, our headquarters uh, at Kamocha. And you also how shamelessly they came with uh, a drone. Uh, the military uh, took us in, uh, and, and, and you know, that kind of uh, injustice that we continue to see. You certainly cannot celebrate independence under such circumstances. So I think that is why, personally, I'm involved in this struggle and why many Ugandans are involved in this struggle to see that Ugandans attain true independence. Right, thank you very much, Secretary General David Lewis Rubongoya. I would like to say it again that if uh, Honorable Minister Nobat Mao is present, please request for the microphone and I will applaud you to the speakers panel um, because you accepted to participate in this Twitter space. Although many people say to me, why is Nobat Mao coming? Like, why? He's a sellout. Why did you invite him? I believe that it's time that those of us who believe in the liberation of Uganda begin having conversations across our different divides. Many in the leadership of the different opposition movements and political parties have called for unity. And I think that those of us who are active on social media spaces can contribute towards that unity by inviting different players across different spectrums of the liberation struggle in Uganda. Nobody can doubt the contribution of Democratic Party. They were existent during the independence, uh, flag independence from the British in Uganda. And when we were thinking about who to invite, it was important for us to have political parties' historical perspective. That is why Norbert Mao, for me, is an important player, although some of us feel he's been compromised. While the allegations of compromise continue, I am one of those who believe um, that while some of us are radical, defiant actors who want a total overhaul of the governance system in Uganda, there are many others who began on this journey, radical as ourselves, and then they got weary. Some gave up the struggle and are doing nothing. They neither stand with those of us who are actively engaged, but they do also do not participate with the government or the regime in power. There are some others who chose to continue serving Ugandans within the junta of Yoweri Museveni. And for me, uh, Honorable Nobat Mao represents that group that were once with us and then joined uh, the current government serving in public offices. And I'm very keen to hear what uh, Honorable Nobat Mao has to say in terms of how he would participate in the struggle while in the government that we are trying to liberate ourselves from. So, Honorable Mao, if you're around, please uh, request for the microphone. You'll be uploaded up to be a panelist. In the meantime, we shall continue with our conversation, and I'll turn to you, Dr. Chisa Vesige. You are not only known as an organizer of defiant resistance against Yoweri Kaguta Museveni's stay in power over Uganda. You are also a four-time presidential candidate vying for the presidency under the political party called Forum for Democratic Change. Given your experience in vying for the presidency, what is the role of elections today in returning power to the people of Uganda? Dr. Besige, you're welcome. Thank you again, uh, Stella. And uh, I also extend my greetings to uh, David Lewis, who joined in. And... Um, uh, I hear you about uh, elections. You see, the reason the struggle for independence happened is that political power was captured by those who captured our nations. And uh, I want to again uh, restate for clarity that Uganda is multinational. We had different nations in Uganda that were all captured and political power taken away by those who captured us, in our case, the British. And that's why the leaders of our nations were, some, some of the leaders were even exiled. Some died in exile. So political power was taken away by the British. And I have been pointing out that political power, especially encompasses four important elements. One is the power over the wealth within the nation or within the nations that were captured. 
So the British took over control of all the wealth within our, country, our nations, which they turned into Uganda. It became British property. And that's why they could exploit our natural resources as their own resources. Take our minerals, take whatever. Land, all land in Uganda became crown land. It became the land of the Queen of England. And the titles, those of us who still have titles given, land titles given during the colonial administration, they were entitled crown land, the land titles. It was land of the crown of, 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 of England. It is the crown of England who gave out the Milo land to those they wanted to give land. It was their land. So that is one of the elements of power that was taken away by colonization. The other one was the power to decide what happens in our land. What takes, what, what is to be done, what is not to be done, what is, where to spend money, where not to spend. All the decisions in the land were taken by the colonial office, not by our people. So our people did not have the power to decide. Now, one of the elements of the power to decide is to decide who governs. It's an element of the power to decide. One of the critical elements, in fact, of the power to decide. Who governs and how they govern. It is a decision that is made by Ugandans. It is that, it is that power to decide that was taken away by the colonial administration. So the fight for independence, among other things, critically was a fight for the vote, a fight for the right to decide who governs, how we are governed. That is what was being celebrated at independence. We are celebrating the right, the return of the right for Ugandans to decide what happens in their land. But as you all know, since independence, it is now 61 years, no leader in the 61 years has been decided on by Ugandans and elevated to the office of leadership. No leader has been removed from office by Ugandans. In 61 years, we have never removed a leader from office. All leaders have been elevated to that office by force of arms. All leaders have been removed by guns, which to me means that the power to decide that had been taken away by the guns of the British has remained taken away by the guns, the same guns of the British, only now commanded by black people. So the power remains firmly held by gunmen. Originally, the white gunmen, Subsequently, for these last 61 years, the black gunmen. Ugandans don't have a vote. Certainly have never exercised a vote to change leaders. Therefore, that's why I contend that the struggle at hand for Ugandans is the struggle for the vote. And that's why how we use our political parties must be highly nuanced because political parties are institutions, democratic institutions. They are institutions that should function in a democratic society to contest for power through citizens deciding whom to give power and how they should use that power. But if our citizens don't have power to give, if they have no vote, it means that political parties cannot do their traditional function of seeking power from citizens because they are seeking power from those who don't have it. The power is with the gunmen. So what we must do as citizens, whether organized under the whatever we call political parties today, or whether organized under civil society uh, organizations, whether organized under faith-based organizations or whatever form of organization, whether our traditional institutions of, of clans and uh, chiefdoms or whatever, what we need to do as a a, a, a society that has no power to decide is first of all to fight just like we fought the British we must fight the gunmen to regain control over their country to regain the power to decide for their country so elections and this is what uh, in my case uh, Stella you pointed out rightly that I have contested four times in elections I, I must say that in the first two contests I was still under the uh, slight, I can't say that it was much, but the slight hope that indeed if citizens are sufficiently informed about the capture of their country, about 
how they need to organize that possibly we could organize and assert the will of people through an electoral process. But I, in, in the, the four elections I contested in, in 2001, there were no parties. Parties were not allowed to function at that time. Everybody could only contest for power as an individual. The individual merit of the, of the movement system was the one in place. And I had been a soldier. I was released from the army only four months before the elections. So even though I participated in that election, there, were, there was no infrastructure to use. There was no time. There. So I could think that there were excuses within which one could say, possibly, if these were not there, we could have done better. And of course, after that election, I went into exile for four years. I returned, unfortunately, on the eve of the next election in 2005. Again, just about four months to the election and spent most of it in prison because as soon as I got back, I was detained. That's when I was charged with treason, with terrorism, with rape and all other things. So again, we went into the election of 2006. The parties by then had been allowed to form. And in our case, FDC had formed, had just formed. It was registered in 2005, uh, a, a, just a short while before the election. So again, one could reasonably argue that there was no preparation infrastructure-wise and uh, time to mobilize and to inform citizens, to rally citizens to, 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 to assert their will. But for me, the cutoff point was in 2011. Because I spent the subsequent five years from 2006 to 2011 here in the country, I considered that what we did in terms of mobilization, organization, um, uh, influencing the formation of will was really uh, reasonable. And I was able to witness firsthand all the shenanigans that uh, 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 rolled out in crippling that possibility of citizens asserting their right to decide. And that is why after 2011, I came to the uh, unequivocal conclusion that an election in and of itself cannot lead to a change to the freedom that the people of Uganda lack, to the rights that they lack, that it will not deliver those. And that what is needed is a struggle, is a fight for our rights, a fight for our freedom. And that is why in 2012, I stepped down as a leader of a party to try and become part of a broad movement for change. Uh, that's when we started uh, what was called Activists for Change. So, uh, to wind up uh, your question, I don't believe that Ugandans have a vote. They are totally disenfranchised. They don't have any franchise. And the struggle is a struggle for a vote. And in order to struggle for a vote, yes, we can organize in our different parties, in civil society groups, but we need to have a common front for change, for freedom. Freedom is not partisan. The rule of law is not partisan. The, uh, having a constitution, a, a, a constitutionalism is not partisan. All of these are primarily uh, tenets that all of us must unite to fight for, which once we get, then we can have a transition to a situation where we can have contestation uh, uh, in a democratic dispensation where citizens can make uh, decisions and give power to those whom they like and remove it from those they are not satisfied with. That's my view. Thank you very much. Well, um, thank you so much, uh, retired Colonel Dr. Kiza Besije, um, uh, for your submission. And um, I will capitalize my question on um, uh, um, uh, political independence. And um, uh, still, before I go to the next question that is directed to um, uh, the Right Honorable David Lewis Rubongoya, um, I would still um, love to invite um, Honorable Minister Nobat Mao. If he's in the audience, kindly request for the microphone. Mm -hmm. And we shall actually add you as a speaker. Now, um, uh, Right Honorable um, uh, David Lewis Rubongoya, on 9th October, um, uh, we saw that um, Uganda police actually uh, cordoned off um, uh, the National Unity Platform headquarters um, and also arresting you along with um, uh, the party spokesperson, the Honorable um, Joel Senyoni, and other supporters of the National um, Unity Platform. And at the time, um, a report has to be produced on the floor of Parliament um, uh, regarding such um, inhuman and illegal actions. We see um, mm -hmm. uh, the Honorable Chinyamatama and other female members of Parliament attack Honorable Zake. So my question is going to be, um, uh, as a leader of a political party and the majority opposition political party uh, in Uganda's national parliament, what role do you think um, uh, the opposition political parties are supposed to play or opposition members of parliament are supposed to spearhead in this struggle to completely liberate Uganda from um, chains of tyranny? Over to you, David Lewis. Much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Solomon. 
I really think uh, that, uh, you know, the, the question of capture needs to be understood in its proper context, that uh, all institutions in our country are under capture. And of course, the very, very first institution is parliament. Parliament, which should be the vanguard of the people. Parliament, where representatives of the people should be uh, meeting to deliberate on uh, matters affecting the country. And of course, to hold the government accountable. But uh, as you can see in our country that, uh, you know, parliament, just like the judiciary and all these other institutions of government have been uh, captured and they will play to the whims of the, of the, of the regime. Uh, that, is, that explains why uh, you, you, you see the kinds of things that keep happening in parliament. Uh, the dictators everywhere, and um, Seven, I think, does that so much, it keeps these institutions in place as a fashed, just to, you know, uh, pretend to the world out there that there's democracy, that there are institutions in the country, and of course to, you know, further his patronage, uh, patronage agenda all across the country. Uh, but whenever parliament has tried to stand in his way, you remember what happened during the passing of, of the famous the known uh, age limit bill and all these other things, you, you saw what happened. So every time any institution uh, will, will try to come up and, and stand in his way, he will come in with, with full force and uh, <clears throat> either dismantle it, uh, bribe members of parliament, compromise uh, some or, you know, arrest others and, and do those kinds of things. So I think uh, parliament needs to be liberated itself. So we cannot just rely on parliament or any other institution for that matter, but uh, we, we as NUP view Parliament as just another front uh, where, because uh, there are so many cameras there, the media is always following up what's going on there. So we always want to use Parliament as one of the fronts. But if you talk to those members of Parliament, you, you'll see the challenges uh, they go through. But, but very importantly, and what every time I, I normally ask Ugandans not to just talk about uh, the members of Parliament who get compromised, indeed those who you've seen fall off and say today uh, I'm, I'm no longer NUP, I'm now following uh, either Genome 7, his son or whatever. What you need to ask yourself is the amount of money that goes into these kinds of uh, ridiculous transactions. You know, if, uh, and, and that's what we, we've been talking about, uh, and, and uh, this conversation about the challenges in FDC, one of the things that people have missed out so much is interrogating. You know, we are talking about money, which uh, people say that the source was state house. This money came from uh, the regime. But this is not Genome 7 is money. He did not sell cows for God's sake to uh, compromise leaders in, in FDC or do whatever kinds of things he's been doing. This is money which should be improving the lives of the people of Uganda. This is money which should be going into education, it should be going into healthcare, which should be going into improving our roads, which should be going into all sorts of things to make the lives of Ugandans better. So um, I think that's something that uh, is very, very important for us to always think about, that uh, the, the, when the members of parliament are being compromised to pass certain laws or when they are uh, you know, being uh, bribed to, to switch from one party to, to join NRM or to do whatever. All that is going in there is money that belongs to the people of Uganda. So for me, I think uh, that the opposition uh, platform in parliament is very important, yes, but you cannot rely on it because, uh, as you know, dictators everywhere will always try to uh, either compromise uh, people in uh, those kinds of positions, members of parliament and others, or to, to, you know, intimidate them, harass them, and therefore break the back of the population. So I think I, I want to agree with uh, Dr. Bess here that the strategy should be building a broader coalition of the willing people, of the willing forces of change, uh, regardless of where people are, whether in parliament or outside parliament, a broader coalition, most importantly, focusing on the people of Uganda. And that is why we call ourselves the People Power Movement. That's why we believe in the power of the people, because we believe that uh, Genome Seveni may have the ability to compromise a few members of parliament, councillors here and there, but he can never compromise uh, the, the, the entire population, which is certainly agitating for change. Right. Thank you very much, um, Doctor. Not Doctor. <laughs> not your Doctor. Maybe, maybe you will do a PhD, David Lewis, when the struggle is over. I want a PhD from you. But thank you very much, Secretary General David Lewis. Um, Apparently, it seems that uh, Norbert Mao has been terrified by both yourself and Dr. Chisa Besuji. I was hoping he'd come and broaden the scope of, of debate and discussion. It sounds like the two of you are in agreement. One of the reasons we have the three people uh, that were advertised to participate is really also about difference in professional expertise and training. And uh, the next session which we shall tackle is about law, human rights, and the judiciary. I was expecting that yourself, uh, Secretary General, and uh, Norbert Mao would discuss the law and as people who are trained as land friends to each other, one as a trainer as well of other lawyers, and then Dr. Vesija would have come in as a person who's been tried, I'm not sure he's been convicted as yet, but has gone through the judiciary system as a suspect many times. Uh, unfortunately, the minister is not yet here. Perhaps he's still on his way because I don't think he's fearful of any of us on this panel. So I will turn again to Dr. Chisa SCJ and say you have been a victim of torture, human rights abuses, 
and undue violence during arrest by police and military officers. Um, we have seen similar forms of torture happening among other, particularly uh, other Ugandans who belong to opposition parties. So many times we've seen wounded victims of torture continuing to be produced and appearing in courts of law, and the presiding magistrates or judges refuse to stay the proceedings pursuant to the law. From your experience with the courts in Uganda, Dr. Vesige, how can violated Ugandans organize to resist and stop further violence, torture, and abuse of unarmed civilians? Dr. Vesige. Yes, Stella. Uh, you see, uh, Louis just told you a short while back that all institutions, once there is state capture, as there is in Uganda, are the first victims of capture. Uh, and uh, I have been a witness to the process of uh, institutional capture. Capture of all state institutions, uh, which included the capture of the military itself that captured the state. <laughs> because, you know, in 1986, when the National Resistance Army captured the power of state of Uganda, which is uh, very uh, clearly spelled out in what was uh, then proclaimed uh, as legal notice number one of 1986, that on that day of 26th January, the army, the National Resistance Army, had captured the state of your power of state of Uganda and vested it in the National Resistance Movement. So there was the army which captured power. There was the party, the National Resistance Movement, which was to manage the power. Both the National Resistance Army and the National Resistance Movement were among the first institutions to be captured by Mr. Museveni who was the leader of both. <laughs> so, because these are institutions that had organs that were functioning, you know, the National Resistance Movement had organs. I was a member of all the organs, the National Executive Committee, the National Resistance Council, the the various committees of the, of the, of the movement. I was a member, literally, of all the, the organs of the, of the movement. And I was witness to how the movement itself was captured and decisions ceased to be taken by the organs of the movement as should have been and were now being taken by the by Mr. Museveni and maybe those he chose to, uh, to work with in taking those decisions, including uh, in making the constitution. One of our uh, first uh, major objections that uh, eventually became public was over the making of the constitution when he called a few people to Kisozi, and they made the constitution and they came back and uh, called us into different groups to brief us on the positions to be adopted in, in the constituent assembly. And of course, we defied, we said absolutely not. We are members of the constituent assembly in our own rights, and uh, the decisions will have to be taken there, not in Kisozi. But eventually, even that uh, did not get very far. So the NRM was captured. The NRA, the National Resistance Army, was captured, which is now, of course, the UPDF, and that's why the UPDF cannot function as, 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 a, as a military institution as it should. And again, it was captured while I was there as, as a senior officer of the UPDF. Uh, and, uh, and, 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 and that's why today you can see uh, General Muhozi, who is a serving officer of that military, uh, violating the, the laws, the rules, the standing orders of the military, violating the laws of Uganda, and nobody in the military in which he serves can, uh, can sanction him. Nobody. Because it's a captured institution by the family. So all institutions are captured, including the judiciary. I was again in court when the black members invaded court on both occasions. I was there in court. I saw judicial officers bleeding, beaten by the black members. The black members were in court to stop a court decision, and they stopped it. The court had, had granted bail to people that Mr. M7 didn't want to be awarded bail, and the black members came and beat up judicial officers and rearrested those that had
Doctor, we seem to be losing you when you talk about the black mambas. Can you hear us? Doctor Chisa Vesij. Solomon, can you hear Dr. Vesij? No, um, I think we have lost him. Um, I request him um to actually um uh, drop off the space and request for the microphone again and we can add him back. But we seem to have lost him. I think he's back. Oh, Dr. Bessinger, you're back? Hello? You something? Yes, you're back. Yes. You, you disappeared when you mentioned the members. Can you proceed, please? <laughs> I hope the members did not hear me and take me off. <laughs> uh, well, the point I was simply making was that the black members attacked once twice, beat up ju judicial officers, and stopped the decisions of court from happening. And since then, I have absolutely no doubt that the judiciary is totally sub 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 subordinate to Mr. Museven. Uh, the independence of the judiciary is certainly no more. And, um, and, and you've seen very recently indeed regarding the questions of bail. You have heard Mr. Museven saying that uh, uh, there are certain people who should not get bail in spite of the constitution of Uganda being clear about bail and actually giving the power to the courts to make the decision on every case according to their discretion. The power under the constitution was given to the courts. But Mr. Museven said, no, some people should not get paid. And indeed, uh, terrorized the judiciary. And what happened? A little later, the Chief Justice Dolo issued what he called guidelines to the court. You cannot give guidelines that draw back constitutional powers. Constitutional power was given to the courts as a discretion of court that people have right to apply for bail whatever they are charged from, they have power to apply for bail to the courts. And the discretion is with the court to grant or not to grant. The, 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 what, what the Chief Justice called guidelines are matters that had been already actually adjudicated over by the Constitutional Court that, the, that now he has created exceptional circumstances, cases in which you need exceptional circumstances if you are to be granted bail or to, 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 to be eligible for bail, that have, you must meet some exceptional circumstances, not provided for under the Constitution. So the, this was, these were guidelines, okay, signed by Dolo, but really Museven, Museven orders. <laughs> so the judiciary no longer has any form of independence. And, and of course, you saw subsequently following those black members and so on, how uh, most ridiculous uh, decisions then started emerging out of what were supposed to be courts of law. Uh, the, the most notable being those uh, made by the, the, the former Deputy Chief Justice uh, Stephen Kavuma, where he would sit in his office and uh, make <laughs> unbelievable <laughs> orders and, and, and judgments. And, and that has continued. So the, I, I have seen the judiciary emasculated, you know, the registry of the, of the judiciary, in fact, was taken over first, and later on, the judicial officers from the lower ones up to the now the, the, the top of the judiciary. And of course, we now live in a situation where after 40 years of Mr. Museveni, all members of all courts have been appointed directly by Mr. Museveni. <laughs> all of them, <laughs> from magistrates' courts to uh, the high court, to the court of appeal, and uh, and the Constitutional Court to the Supreme Court, they are all direct appointees of Mr. Museven. Of course, uh, one can argue that uh, there is still some uh, provision within the Constitution talking about uh, uh, security of tenure of the office of a judge and things like that. But we all know that uh, indeed, one, and everybody who is appointed knows that uh, without, uh, the sec without the rule of law, and, 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 and you've seen uh, just recently what, what was happening with the uh, Supreme Court Justice Kisachi, you know, very despicable <laughs> so things that happen in, in our institutions uh, that forced eventually Justice Kisake, Kisachi to take the Chief Justice to court, <laughs> to, to his own court. <laughs> and and uh, I think recently I heard that uh, she has now eventually been forced, uh, I don't know, forced or negotiated with, I don't know, but she has applied to take early retirement and to leave the judiciary. So that is the trajectory of anybody who tries to, uh, in any form or manner, uh, exercise their independence. 
So there is no more independence of the of the judiciary. The judiciary is part and parcel of the terror machine now of the government. Of course, if something is not political, if maybe they are too litigants uh, quarreling over some something, uh, there it will only be the usual corruption. But any matter that touches on politics, that touches on um, the power of uh, uh, of the Museveni family in any form or manner, whether it is related to the economy, whether it is related to the service industry or anything, anything that they have interest in, they will be the judges. And, uh, and, 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 and so uh, that's why even in elections, talking about an electoral, an election petition is frankly a, a, a joke. That's why in my last uh, two elections, I didn't bother Although it was very clear that there was robbery, I didn't bother to go to the court. Well, in, two, in 2016, I didn't even have the opportunity anyway. I was totally blockaded in my house. I, even if I had wanted, I wouldn't have gone. But going to court to accuse Museveni, you would rather go to state house and accuse him there. Because he's the same person you are going to find in the court. Well, um, uh, thank you so much, um, uh, Colonel Dr. Kiza um, Besige, um, for those wonderful um, uh, remarks. Um, indeed, um, law should be the cement of society, um, uh, as one of my lecturers, Professor um, Oloka Onyango, once told me, but it's unfortunate. So I'm turning to you, um, uh, David Lewis Rubongoya. You are not only a lawyer, but also a teacher of the law in Uganda universities. And I would love you to explain to our audience tonight, um, uh, amidst the abstract lawlessness in Uganda, why is the law important to protect the poor people, the opposition members, and uh, government critics, and how can we redeem the law so that it can actually work for all Ugandans, regardless of their political parties, um, ethnicity, or class, or sexuality? Um, uh, thank you so much, David. You can come in. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Solomon. I think uh, the, the central theme of uh, today, what ran through um, uh, the discourse, is the question of capture. Uh, uh, if you do not uh, resolve the question of uh, governance at the top, then these are the challenges you get to have. As you know, uh, you know, uh, personally, like I said, I was uh, teaching constitutional law. And uh, the reason why I decided to actually move out of the classroom and come into the trenches and do the kind of work we're doing now, uh, alongside many other Ugandans, of course, uh, was because I saw that what I was teaching and what happens in the real sense are completely different. You know, you, you're just in a classroom teaching uh, students about uh, you, uh, the right to liberty. Uh, you're, you're telling them about the right to life. And, you know, th th all that is not working. You're, you're telling them about uh, separation of powers, judicial independence, and all these concepts which have been rendered useless in, in our context right now. So that is why it is very important for all of us uh, Ugandans to join the struggle to liberate our country and be able to have a functioning democracy and at the center of that democracy is a question of the rule of law is a question of constitutionalism that uh, the, the the idea of constitutionalism goes beyond uh, mere laws because in uganda some of the laws regardless of uh, some of the unconstitutional amendments that have taken place we still have some of the good laws uh, including our constitution which provides under article 23 for example uh, you know how a person should be arrested how uh, personal liberty should be taken away under what circumstances and what must happen thereafter but, but you see what is going on in, in our country for the past uh, three years, you've seen how the regime has clamped down on NUP supporters. Almost every week, we have abductions. We have Ugandans who are abducted. Uh, right now, we are dealing with the question of uh, Ugandans who were abducted before and immediately after the 2021 election, who are missing up to now. And, you know, we have we, uh, used the law. We've gone to courts of law. Uh, for some of the cases, we even have court orders, uh, habeas corpus orders, like uh, for John Damlida, because John Damlida was a 50-year-old man who was taken away from Chiseka Market. People saw a drone taking him and other people, and up now, he has not surfaced. Nobody knows what happened to him, except those people who took him. He was taken out by the military. So we went to court. The high court issued a habeas corpus order. Up to now, it is, it is not working. Recently, a young man was taken away, uh, called Alex Kaiwa. We, we got a court order, uh, you know, from the high court, even when uh, indeed, it's always difficult to get these orders from these courts and all that but, but sometimes through struggle and uh, you know um you, you're able to get a court order it is just disrespected so in this particular case we took the court order to uh Chiyaka, and the family members were told that uh that man was taken away by the military and they, they told him we have so many court orders they, they just told the family that a court order means nothing so we have so many uh, court orders piled up somewhere we will release this young man when we feel like releasing him. And that is the situation in our country. So um, when you talk about the law, it, it is important to know that uh, the law has been subdued. Uh, we, we are living under the rule of the gun and not the rule of law. And that is what our struggle is about, to ensure that there is rule of law. The reason why the rule of law is important it is, is because it ensures 
equity. It ensures that everyone is equal before and under the law. And these are uh, very, very important principles. But now what we have in, in this country is impunity. Just uh, they break even the existing laws with impunity and they will tell you what, what can you do. So, uh, for example, the, the law on 48 hours, which says that you should be produced before court or released within 48 hours, is just simply violated. They don't care about it. They just pick you up. Uh, the law says that if somebody, if someone is arrested, they should have access to their lawyers, they should have access to uh, their next of kin, they should have access to a physician if they so wish. But that has been taken away. People are just taken and kept in places not gazetted by law. And of course, when you talk about the capture of institutions, you just look at the Human Rights Commission, which is a very, very important uh, institution. If you look at Articles 51, 52, and 53 of the Constitution of Uganda, the Human Rights Commission has several powers, it has several functions. It should be a very important uh, you know, institution in, in a country like ours. But, but you see the chairperson of that commission speak and you wonder how a person supposed to be a chairperson of the Human Rights Commission can reason and think in that manner. She's just partisan and, and that's what has happened to the institutions because uh, like General Museveni said at some point that he was going to fill the courts with cadre judges, that's what he has done with all these other institutions. So you have a Human Rights Commission, for example, if you look at the report, uh, the so-called report they released this week, they themselves provided a list of Ugandans who they acknowledged were detained by the military for a month, for two months, but they don't say anything about it. It is as if they are maybe a media house just reporting. They are not talking about the fact that these are illegalities. They are not giving orders to the regime to ensure that Ugandans are not abducted and held in places not gazetted by law as required by the laws of Uganda. So really the, the point here is that the laws cannot work if you do not have the rule of law, if you do not have constitutionalism, if uh, General Museveni and his people see laws not as a, as a tool for social justice, but as a tool to keep themselves in power. That is why they will respect, they will, they will refer to the constitution as long as it, 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 it helps them keep power. So they will talk about, or they will, after rigging elections, they will say, oh, the constitution says let's have elections, now we have a legitimate government. But any provision of the constitution which stands in their way to further their agenda, to further their uh, continuous stranglehold over, uh, on power in our country, that provision is quickly swept away, either through illegal amendments or simply violated with impunity. So I think one of the things that needs to be uh, redeemed in our country is the law itself, is the rule of law to, to ensure that uh, the law can operate and that the law can be respected by all and that uh, violators of human rights, for example, or violators of the law are going to be held accountable. Right, so it's the top of the hour and I want to thank both of you for your generosity sharing your responses. We have tackled a little bit about the history of Uganda at independence, uh, sent through the eyes and experiences of a six-year-old Chisa SJ and a comparison of uh, David Lewis who was born 26 years later. And uh, then we talked briefly about the law, human rights. We did talk about political organizing and what that would entail in a post-independence moment in order to liberate ourselves. We shall briefly touch on public services, issues of security and sovereignty, and then we shall open up the space to the long list of people requesting for the mic. I recognize all of you. And so I want to turn to uh, Dr. Bersige and talk about public services, particularly those that are important for poor people. Dr. Bersige, you're trained as a medical doctor. That's your profession. How can Uganda be independent for 61 years, yet our public health facilities are in deplorable conditions? Mothers still die while giving birth. Hospitals lack medicines. Our health workers are underpaid, but overworked and unappreciated by the executive. What must citizens do? What must we do to overcome the public health crisis in Uganda, Dr. Vesige? Well, thank you very much. Um, maybe before I turn on that, I, I have just seen in the audience uh, uh, Mr. Kakwenza Ruchirabasaja, uh, one of the victims of recent uh, torture. Uh, who later fled and joined you uh, in Germany. And before fleeing, he passed through the courts that we have been talking about. And not before an ordinary magistrate, but one who has a PhD, I understand, in law. Somebody called Dr. Singiza, uh, where he was paraded before the time for opening courts. He was dripping, of course, with blood and pus from his wounds. And uh, this uh, magistrate who was at Buganda Road went ahead to remand this very badly tortured individual uh, to the maximum security uh, prison. And uh, the, the, uh, that uh, goes to demonstrate 
the type of courts. But what is uh, uh, significant in all this is that since then, Dr. Singiza has been promoted. He's now a high court judge. And, uh, uh, and, and that is the trajectory. Uh, I will not be surprised if Dr. Singiza is not uh, leading uh, the high court or the court of appeal or the Supreme Court uh, soon, because that is the trajectory. Uh, they, they, they are Dr. Singiza, as like Justice Sekana and so on. Now, let me turn back to your question regarding uh, services. Uh, you see, I, in my introductory uh, remarks pointed out that Uganda today is a state of apartheid where you have different services for different people, different rights for different people, different opportunities for different people. And uh, uh, those who enjoy the best are a handful of people who are around those that captured our country, Mr. Museveni and his family, and a ring of cronies and their hangers on. The rest of the country uh, is there to service that uh, supreme uh, privileged category of people. Uh, and th that's why it's not just services, it's rights. Anybody who is not amongst those privileged, you can be killed, you can be imprisoned, you can, anything can happen to you, you have no rights. That's what uh, Lewis was talking about. So what has happened is that the resources, and especially this has uh, been dramatic in the last 40 years of the NRM Junta, the priority of the NRM Junta has been entrenchment and hold on to power. So all resources that are needed in that scheme of things, of entrenching the family of Mr. Museveni and increasing its power and uh, hold on to it, everything is done to spend in that area. And that includes the patronage system that, again, uh, Lewis was talking about. The patronage system is meant to bribe leaders so that they support the entrenchment of the family rule. The, uh, the, 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 the security system that is totally pervasive. You had some time back when they were talking about crime preventers, that we had 11 million, was it 11 million crime preventers in a population of 40, uh, 40 million, that you have 10 million crime preventers, uh, in fact, uh, more than 10. Uh, so it means that in every four citizens, uh, there, there is uh, some kind of a crime uh, somebody to prevent. And the crime prevent, of course, is uh, a byword for uh, an agent to, 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 to safeguard the, uh, the family rule. Uh, and, and these people cost money. They are given T-shirts. They are given all kinds of things. They cost money, money which does not go into production, money which does not go into services, but into consumption related to the entrenchment and hold on to power by those that captured the country. So, and of course, developing maybe some elite services for themselves. Uh, even though, uh, in our case, one wonders even how they, they do that. Maybe Mr. Museveni, whom I understand moves with a mobile hospital uh, on wheels, uh, with the doctors and so on, that has even a mobile theater within uh, uh, his uh, very, very huge convoy. But even for that one, you know, you see, th there is no escape from the benefit of an integrated, for example, healthcare system. Because even if you try to protect yourself, these common goods and services, there are some that cannot thrive at a family level. That's why they, you, you need them at a, at a, at a higher level. Um, uh, uh, that you need blood banks around the country, that if you get an accident anywhere in the country, you can quickly access blood, you can quickly access emergency services, and so on and so forth. All this um, uh, is not there. Uh, we have, uh, I don't know how many uh, tear gas vehicles in the country. In every town now, wherever you go, you'll find the bigger towns. There are tear gas vehicles parked there and members. But you won't find a firefighting equipment. You won't find an ambulance. <laughs> you, you won't find the, 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 
uh, vehicles that would be helpful for protecting the common uh, the, 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 the common good and especially uh, the uh, health care uh, and, and well-being of, of, of citizens. So it's no doubt that, uh, you know, we don't have a health care system, for example, to talk about in Uganda. None. Zero. Because even when you have what they call hospitals or health centers, those are buildings and maybe inside the buildings you may have facilities, but these do not amount to a system that oversees the health of a society. They don't. Health of a society requires an integrated system that includes uh, an infrastructure of manpower, of, uh, of systems, of equipment that overall will have continued monitoring of what happens to every citizen uh, so that they stop citizens from becoming unwell. What we have are scattered and uh, very, very shambolic institutions that one may run to when you are sick. But that's not the, the purpose of health care. Health care, the purpose of health care is to make sure that people don't become sick. And that then those few that uh, maybe uh, fall through the system that cares for them, that they have uh, an elaborate mechanism to, to make them well again very quickly. That is what is totally absent in Uganda. And let me be clear, these will not change. The absence of services, whether education, whether health, whether water and sanitation, whether the absence of these services will not change as long as the political system does not change. So the solution does not lie in maybe going to parliament to cry for more money to be put in health, because however much money, even if, even if it was put in health, we shall not have a health care system. What must be done is to overhaul the whole political system. And that's why we must all citizens that are affected unite and simply say enough is enough we must rebel against the system of capture that has captured our state we must disobey thoroughly what they are doing and bring it to an end and manage a transitory period where we rebuild first of all the political system that we have a constitution in which we all believe and that we are ready to protect that we have a, a, a legal framework, a, a rule of law system that is established, that we have institutions that can function. And, and, and it is only then that we can start having uh, responsive institutions that care for the citizens. Well, um, uh, thank you so much, um, Dr. Kiza Vesice, for that wonderful submission. Now I'll thank turn you. to you, um, uh, Right Honorable David Lewis Rubongoya. And um, uh, I know you are um, a highly educated person within Uganda and outside Uganda, and that qualifies you to be an educationalist. With a big gap um, existing between expensive private um, education and the um, uh, cheap with um, deplorable conditions existing within the UPE and USE um, uh, education system, what is the meaning of 61 years of independence? Um, kindly come in, David Lewis. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I think, uh, of course, um, uh, like, like I already mentioned, I think we, uh, the, the central question is uh, about capture. Uh, if you see the investment in education in our country, it, it's, it's really laughable, uh, to say the least. Just look at uh, how much money is being spent by the regime in form of capitation grant. Uh, at some point, they're talking about 10,000 shillings for a whole year uh, for, for, for a pupil. And that explains uh, the numbers of, uh, you know, uh, pupils or children who actually drop out uh, before P7, uh, people start primary school, P P1, and drop out before P7. And that is a very big problem, of course, because the regime in Uganda has not invested in education as it has not invested in healthcare and all these other public services. Uh, those of you who have traveled have seen that the, the difference between uh, Uganda, and I think one of the biggest problems I see for the future of Uganda is really about this kind of education that uh, these children are getting. The other day I was seeing a, a video of children being asked very, very basic questions. Uh, you know, these are people in about P6, P7, and they cannot answer them uh, simply because the, the education system in Uganda, first of all, does not, cannot respond to the needs of the present generation, but also because it's not funded. It, it, uh, there's no investment. You know, uh, the teachers are poorly paid. Uh, you, you, you've seen teachers who tell you that they go and write border borders uh, in the morning and then come back to school. You've seen how some uh, good enough the media has been covering some of these stories. Children who study under trees 
and, and all these uh, challenges that uh, we have with, with, uh, with education. So I think that that's a terrible thing because any serious government or any government that really cares for the people would be concerned about education. That's the, the best way we, you can build for the future. You have to invest in education. You have to ensure that uh, the, the, the children of the nation are getting quality education. But that begins with uh, you know, just not uh, looking at infrastructure, but ensuring that you have a proper curriculum. Then you have teachers who are well-paid, who are motivated, who are well-facilitated. So I think one of the challenges that our country will grapple with, even long after Museveni and his uh, criminal regime are gone, will be the question of education. How, uh, you, you know, you have a, a, a whole generation of people who are dropping out of schools, uh, and, and therefore, and even those who finish school, they're not getting quality education. Uh, then, then you have uh, a problem of massive uh, cheating of exams uh, because of the corruption that is now deep rooted in uh, our societies. I saw the headline today of a uh, uh, monitor talking about uh, people who have been uh, selling exams on, 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 on the black market and that kind of thing. So I think there's a lot that has gone wrong with education in Uganda. And if you juxtapose what we spend on uh, education, for example, uh, with what Museveni spends every day, we're talking about uh, close to three billion shillings every every day, every single day, not a week, nothing, but just every single day. And you look at what goes into healthcare, you see what goes into agriculture, and you see what they, they spend under what they call classified expenditure. Then you, you, you're left with no option but to cry for our country. And of course, the sad thing is that the powers that be, those who rule over us, their children are not going to school here in Uganda. A majority of them are either, if they are in Uganda, they are in international schools which are well facilitated, and others have been flown to better uh, schools in uh, Europe, in the US, etc., etc. So you can see the crisis that uh, we are going to, to face as a country. Uh, of course, uh, and I think uh, Doctor uh, made reference to it. The, the challenge is that uh, the regime may be thinking that by not investing in education, in healthcare, in productive sector sectors of the of the economy, that they are punishing these poor people. But, but ultimately, they, they are punishing themselves because uh, these uh, all these uh, unemployed people will eventually turn not not just against uh, anybody else, but even they themselves. Because uh, you, if you see uh, the, the levels of crime that uh, keep going up in our country, uh, you, you know you, you just go uh, when you're driving around Kampala, you have to make sure that uh, your windscreen is up because uh, uh, the, the windows of your car are up because uh, you fear that someone is going to grab your phone. It is it is so. If, if those who govern us, those who rule over our country, do not think about the common good. But ultimately, they themselves are victims of that system that they have created. When they get accidents on the roads, where are they taken? You, you saw the other time when uh, uh, Badio Munsi uh, got a, a challenge and he had to be airlifted to Kampala. And many of them, of course, do not get that opportunity because they have not invested in the services which would matter to the people. And certainly for me, I am very, 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 very concerned. And, you know, as a, as, as a lecturer, um, I, I kept seeing students who come to universities and you ask them very, very basic questions and they, they simply have no idea. And, and you're like, what are we dealing with in our country? You know, someone goes through the ranks. At some point, they said, under UPE, no one should repeat a class. Everyone should be promoted, promoted. So, so that's the crisis you have in, in our country. So someone goes through primary. They, they, they find their way through secondary, go to university. When they have simply no idea about uh, even the basic things that uh, you would expect uh, them to be thinking about. So I, I think it's a very, very big challenge. It's a big crisis. But like uh, Dr. Said and uh, like we've been saying here, that situation will not change until we are able to redeem our country from the mess it finds itself in. Right. Thank you very much, Secretary General David Luis Um We had preserved a question for Minister Nobat Mao on the land question, because land is important to our identity, particularly our post-independence identity as Ugandans. Perhaps in your closing remarks, both of you will comment on the land question. Please think about what you might, how you might address that issue and keep it for the last submission you will make. I want to now turn to the interesting question of freedoms, freedom of gender and sexuality, freedom of movement and press freedom. Dr. Vesige, I was once forbidden from boarding a plane because similar to yourself, I was slapped with a travel ban. My name was on the no-fly list that the CMI and SFC ran and operate in Entebbe. And I only fought this in court and won after three years. Similar to yourself and as Secretary General David Lewis Rubongoya has mentioned in this pa uh, panel, this space, we watched the forceful abduction of Bobby Wine from a plane on Independence Day, followed by clandestine transportation to his home, where he was subjected to house arrest. Dr. Vesige, why is Museveni's state apparatus afraid of the free movement in the country, out of the country, and back into the country of opposition political leaders? Why does our freedom of movement scare a person with such powerful oppressive power
Dr. Besage, are you still there? Please unmute yourself. Dr. Chisa Besage, can you hear us? Perhaps I will request that you step down from the space and return and then come back to the question of freedom of movement. And perhaps, uh, Solomon, you can ask Secretary General David Lewis Rubongoya his question concerning freedom of expression and movement and press freedom. Well, uh, thank you so much, um, Dr. Stella. Um, uh, coming to you, um, uh, Right Honorable David Lewis. Before I go to the Right Honorable David Lewis Rubongoya, we had a question preserved for the um, uh, Minister of Justice and Constitutional Affairs, that is the Honorable Nobat Mao, which was to explain as to why Uganda is persecuting um, Ugandan homosexuals. Um, and I will pass it over to the audience, those that are going to request for the microphone. Kindly um, think about that. Um, so, um, uh, right Honorable David Lewis Rongoya, I'm going to actually ask you um, uh, about um, uh, freedom of expression, which seems to be one of the most um, uh, powerful tools of uh, frustrating um, a dictatorship like uh, the one in Uganda. So um, what, uh, how consistent can Ugandans um, continue um, uh, exercising their freedom of expression um, regardless of the intimidation and the persecution that comes to it? And why do you think Museveni is so afraid of Ugandans exercising their freedom of expression? Come in, um, David Lewis, to explain. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, my brother Solomon, I wish you referred to me as David, by the way. I don't like the idea of uh, being referred to as right, honorable, honorable, and all that uh, all the time. Uh, but, but that's uh, on the side. Um, so I think the freedom of expression has suffered just like many other freedoms have suffered under the dictatorship. But of course, you know the potential or the, 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 the power of uh, expression. Uh, regimes are always frightened by expression. And we've seen the persecution of uh, Dr. Stella Nyanzi because of her expression. And indeed, many other people I see, Jimmy Spire, of course, I, I've seen uh, my brother Kakwenza and many others who have uh, either fled the country, some have been forced into silence simply because of trying to express themselves. And of course, as you know, expression does not just take the form of uh, a speech. There are many other forms of expression. But any form of expression that, uh, you know, criticizes or condemns uh, Museveni and his regime, uh, he gets frightened and uh, therefore he has to come in with all uh, force to try and ensure that people are not speaking out and to ensure that people are not going to criticize him. And that is because uh, the more people come out, if uh, Kakwenza writes a book criticizing him and nothing happens to him, it means that other Ugandans are being encouraged to write books, to do all sorts of things. So that is why, for example, in Uganda, Facebook is illegal. Everyone of us who is accessing Facebook has to use VPN because the people, uh, the Ugandans on Facebook simply do not want the regime. And they, they, they have been constantly expressing themselves in that regard to say enough is enough. So the, the regime is certainly very, very scared of uh, Ugandans expressing themselves. Uh, and, 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 and of course, that goes uh, with the freedom of assembly, which has been uh, clamped down so much uh, because, again, Museveni and his regime know that they are not legitimate. They know that they no longer have the love and the support of the people. Then they know that they have to use suppressive means to keep in power at, at all times. You know, I was uh, seeing a quotation when uh, General Museveni at some point was saying, uh, when he had come in, when he, when he was, uh, you know, when, when he believed that he did not need a lot of security to be among citizens because he has not stolen anyone's property. But look at him now and, and the way he moves. Uh, it, it really speaks to the shift and, and, and they know very well that Ugandans do not vote for them. Ugandans do not like them. And so they have to use all means to, 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 to clamp down on, uh, on any sort of dissent. And, you know, because uh, the, the, uh, we, we live under what, what you'd call a hybrid regime or what uh, Professor Oloka Onyango has called benevolent dictatorships. You know, if they feel that they are not overly threatened by your expression, they will let you uh, speak. So you'll find a few uh, critical articles in the monitor. They know that many people, after all, are not going to read these. Uh, people out in the villages, uh, many of them do not have TVs or whatever. So they, 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 they will have to balance it up. That is why it is going to be very easy for our president, Chagulani, or Dr. Besije, to go on, a, on any radio station in Kampala. But if he goes to a radio station in Karamoja or in Isinjiro or somewhere, most likely they will either switch off the radio station or they will pull him off the radio station and that kind of thing, because that is how these kinds of dictatorships operate. So that is why they are threatened by expression, because... Uh, it, it's amazing. If you go in the countryside, there are many times I've gone to places like Karamoja, even parts of Western Uganda, even parts of, uh, uh, in some places in, in, in uh, the central region and other parts, and you find people are completely ignorant about politics, 
about anything you just go to uh, some remote areas in teso and you know because people don't have any kind of information you know there's a, a diesel there's a, a viso there's a, a piso all these are uh, internal security organization people they, they are RDCs and all that who are there to monitor and ensure that the kind of message which reaches those people is uh, in praise of the regime how the parish development model is going to uh, the, the parish development model is going to get them out of poverty how uh, genome 7 is a hero and that kind of thing that's the only information they get to uh, to access and that is why we've been intensifying efforts of course you can see the number of ugandans on social media but it is important that we use uh, other means really uh, we, we must come up with with a inventive means of getting to the population, making sure that they get the message, even when there is a serious clampdown on the freedom of expression and the freedom of assembly. And maybe finally, on that point of assembly, you've seen that uh, Genome 7 is model has been to clamp down on any sort of protest, whether it is by doctors, whether it is by students of Makede, whether it is by any group. And he doesn't care how many you are, even if you're just 10 or 20, because he knows the power of that. So the citizens need to understand the, the reason why Genome 7 clamps down on assembly is because he knows its power. So the people of Uganda need to embrace it even more because he knows very well that if the people of Uganda gather in their numbers, they will be able to uh, uh, send him away with his uh, small clique of people who have uh, oppressed us far too long. Thank you very much, Secretary General um, David Lewis. Thank you as well for highlighting for us that you prefer to be addressed as David Lewis. Um, part of the discussion that's happening away from the Twitter space is some people who are complaining about your title that Solomon insists on using of honorable. If Solomon, my co-host, a member of the National Unity Platform, chooses to address anybody as honorable, who are we to question Solomon's decision? David Lewis has clarified that he is David Lewis. I call him David Lewis or Secretary General David Lewis. Dr. Chiza Vesije had lost um, the space and he seems to have dropped off again. Dr. Vesije. Dr. Bessiger, are you there? Well, um, yes. Dr. Chiza Bessiger, I have now uploaded you as a speaker. The question that you missed was in the area of freedoms. David Lewis has explained to us briefly about freedom of expression, digital freedom, freedom of the press, right to assemble, right to protest, um, as given to us in the Constitution. Can you hear me, Dr. Chiza Bessiger? Yes, happily I am back. Very good. Welcome back. Teddy uh, Kuzikiza. And the question that you missed when you dropped off was around freedom of movement. And I had said that I was once forbidden from boarding a plane because similar to yourself, my name was on the no-fly list and I was traveled, I was slapped with a travel ban, which I fought in court and won after three years. Similar to yourself, we watched the forceful violent abduction of Bobby Wine from a plane on Independence Day. The same has been explained to us in the panel we are having. And this was followed by clandestine transportation to his home, where he was subjected to house arrest, an experience you yourself know about. So the question to you, Dr. Besige, is why is Museveni and his state apparatus, why are they afraid of the free movement of opposition political leaders? Well, I guess uh, from what I heard uh, my brother Louis say uh, that I associate entirely with is uh, uh, significant uh, uh, in covering the question, uh, you know, uh, indeed, I have been prohibited from flying out of Uganda a number of times. On one occasion, they actually pulled me from the aircraft before it left. I was on Kenya Airways and uh, had checked in normally, had my boarding pass normally until uh, we were boarding, and uh, I was told uh, there were orders that I cannot fly out of uh, of Entebbe. Uh, they even attempted to give orders when I was coming back from Nairobi during the time of the protests in 2011. After my treatment uh, in Nairobi, uh, I was prevented from boarding again. Kenya was they told the Kenya was they would not give them landing rights if I was on the aircraft. And so, again, I had a boarding pass in Nairobi, but Kenya always told me that they had had instructions that if I am on the aircraft, as had been manifested, they would not give them landing rights. So they offloaded me, and by the way, I took them to court also <laughs> in, in Kenya for doing that. <laughs> uh, and fortunately, they, that was during the Kibaki government, and uh, the parliament protested. The parliament was sitting that afternoon, and there was a heavy protest. And eventually, the following day, they allowed me to board and come back to Entebbe. Uh, and of course, uh, I have gone through the similar experiences that uh, 
President Chagulani went through recently. Uh, I was again grabbed from the airport and taken through the old airport and uh, driven through some Panya roads all the way up to home. I took civil aviation uh, authority to court for allowing a kidnap on me in their facilities at the airport. Even those who kidnapped me were putting on reflectors written on civil aviation authority. Although they this space was downloaded via spacesdown.com. Visit to download your spaces today. Yeah. Uh, I think, and terrorism staff or something. Uh, so I, I actually took civil aviation authority to court. Unfortunately, I landed in the court of Justice Sekana. <laughs> and <laughs> and uh, one, one would be uh, intrigued to, re- to read his ruling. <laughs> you know? uh, though he, in the end, he granted me 10 million uh, as, uh, as uh, some kind of compensation for the inconveniences that I suffered, of course, the million, that even the 10 million I have never, I have never received, and I don't think I can rec- I receive it. But uh, the, 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 the reasoning behind all those crude actions are two. First of all, they, uh, they want to uh, impose uh, fear on those whom you are supposed to be uh, leading to protest and to uh, uh, to assert their will and to say, you know, this is our country, we must have rights and so on. They want to demonstrate to them that uh, you can be denied and you will do nothing. You are nothing. They they have all the power. They want, it's a demonstration of power to the, to the powerless so that they cause despondency. People say now, if even Bessie whom we thought was, uh, you know, our leader was, if he can be treated in this way, even when they terrorize us, uh, injure us, and do all kinds of things on us. Yes, partly it is, of course, also to terrorize us, the individuals, but a lot of it is aimed at the general public to show that, look at what is happening to this one. Know that we can do us to you. So it's, it's to instill fear and despondency to the population. And of course, also on the other hand, it is to deny uh, at critical moments the ability to rally international uh, opinion against the the junta. They don't want you to be out there rallying international opinion and uh, mobilizing uh, uh, against uh, the junta because the part of their survival depends on international some kind of international legitimacy. That uh, that's why even they conduct elections. They would never have conducted elections save to try and say we are also le- elected. We are legitimate through our people uh, voting for us, although they know that nobody votes, really they are not voted, but uh, uh, they want that kind of legitimacy. And so uh, part of it is to, uh, to, to, to interfere with uh, the attack on their international uh, legitimacy. But also let me say this, that you see, as I pointed out a little earlier, the preoccupation of any junta, any dictatorship, and certainly the one we are dealing with here in Uganda of the family of Mr. Museveni, uh, the methods they use, the preoccupation of holding on to power and the methods they use to do so are fairly regular. They are similar all over the world. First of all, it is to instill fear in all citizens. And part of it is that uh, brutality that they they, 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 they display they, the display of brutality. Uh, if they will torture Kakwens and everybody sees what happened to his body, then they, everybody cringes when they think about uh, writing what Kakwenza wrote. Everybody fears to say anything. So the terror, part of it is just to terrorize the minds. This is why these are talking about terrorism, that, uh, the, that the international community fights terrorism. They should first fight dictators, because all dictators are terrorists. <laughs> and, and, and we have a terrorist regime here in Uganda. Uh, so if you are fighting terrorism, you must fight these regimes. And that's what they use to terrorize the minds of citizens. Secondly, in terms of uh, uh, the, the, the freedom of media, which uh, uh, Louis was talking about, they, wa- they don't want any views that are uh, opposed to what they are doing to proliferate within the population. So they, their aim is to curtail any form of uh, information they consider subversive because they, they uh, and indeed maybe it is subversive to their objectives. They want to stop it, so they will not allow you to hold meetings, to talk uh, to, to 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 the population through the media outlets and so on and so forth. 
while on the other hand, they invest massively on those who should propagate their own propaganda. So you have people who are scattered all over the media houses, including the social media. They have uh, houses where they pay people to come and manage social media accounts. You find somebody having 50 social media accounts and he's paid daily to be on those social media accounts, drumming up things for the junta and uh, shutting down, opposing, abusing those who have varying, uh, varying opinions. So all of these are mechanisms aimed at perpetuating themselves in power. Terror, media, the use of money and patronage, these are standard measures. The, the, the division, divide and rule, making sure that those who are terrorized, oppressed, marginalized, don't unite to say no. They don't develop a common voice. They don't develop a concerted action amongst themselves. So they must divide them and even better still, pit them against each other so that instead of uniting to fight the common enemy they are fighting amongst themselves. All these are uh, uh, approaches that we live with here daily in Uganda. Ca they are cultivated, they have now, they have institutions for conducting all this, for dividing the population, for causing intrigue within any organization, they, whether they are state institutions, whether they are church, church or religious or faith-based organizations, they will try to cause confusion in all of them so that people cannot uh, put their heads together to say, no, we are getting finished by this small group that is uh, terrorizing and uh, robbing the country. So we all must know that we have to fight against all these injustices. We have to, if we are to liberate the country, we must win against terror. We must win against their propaganda. We must win against their money which they use to buy our leaders. We must win against the attempts to disunite us, to foment uh, conflict amongst the, the prisoners, the captives in the country. And if we do these things, then we can assert the will of the people of Uganda and then uh, we can live in a, a free and democratic society. Thank you. Well, um, thank you so much, um, Colonel Kiza Bestige. And um, at this point, we are going into the last segment of our questions, and we are going to open up the discussion to the audience. And um, uh, we shall start this segment. The first question was supposed to go to Chairman Mao, who is not here. So um, I'll ask uh, Honorable David Lewis Rubongo, yeah? you'll pardon me. Um, for calling you honorable because I'm used um, to uh, passing on the honor to the men that have gone before me, like yourself. Um, to begin with, um, uh, Uganda claims to be a sovereign state, uh, but according to our financial independence, we are actually dependent on foreign loans that are actually misappropriated due to corruption, a very big disease that the General Yoweri Kaguta Museveni confirms on 10th December 2022 that um, actually um, uh, his government officials are corrupt, and it's uh, something they have failed to um, actually overcome. Uh, Betty Kamia Hassoff, um, the IGG says that um, it's true. Um, corrupt officials are shielded by the president of the Republic of Uganda. And Nakalema, the chairperson of the anti-corruption uh, unit, says that why she failed to do her anti-corruption uh, um, auditing work was simply because the president was shielding um, corrupt officials. So simply my question is, how do you think we can redeem our independent, our financial independence and claim sovereignty in the region? Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, well, first of all, it is true that uh, corruption is uh, such a terrible cancer in our country. Uh, the IGG's office itself said that we lose over 10 trillion uh, shillings every year to corruption. And you can imagine um, what that money can do. Just, just imagine, even if you got a fraction of that money that we lose corruption every year, and uh, invested it in infrastructure, in uh, making roads. Just look at uh, the potholes in Kampala. The other day, after a successful campaign against those potholes, Genome 7 committed just 6 billion shillings to fix those potholes. And so you can imagine if we were able to uh, curb, first of all, wastage, the wastage of uh, public resources, and the blatant theft of those resources, you can imagine how significantly we would be able to improve not just the economy, but uh, social services, and, and of course, ultimately, the economy in, in one or the other. And of course, uh, you're able to get jobs for the young people and uh, and many other things to improve uh, our country. But the question of corruption should also be looked into in the, in the context of uh, state capture that we talked about. You see, once there's political corruption, then you lose legitimacy and you lose uh, the moral authority to condemn corrupt government officials. So and every time General Seven speaks about corruption, 
I'm, I'm sure these corrupt officials are looking at him and, and, and saying, but you're the chief priest of corruption. You know, corruption begins in state house, which has been described as a clearing house. And so if corruption begins from the very uh, echelons of power, then how do you keep talking about it and, and, and paying lip, sub, lip, uh, lip service to the fight against corruption? So I think uh, we need to understand that uh, the, the fight against corruption cannot, you cannot even talk about it until you deal with the governance question. You know, General Seven had to bribe members of parliament to remove uh, term limits and suddenly he bribed them again to remove age limits. And what that means is that he is in power today because of corruption. He rigs elections with impunity, which is corruption. These are uh, members of parliament who are bought every other day and other political leaders. You hear that he has uh, now bought a political party. Um, I don't know why Nobat Mao is not here, but um, you, you all know what happened to, to, to the leadership of DP and the challenges we have now in uh, uh, FDC and, and other parties, uh, UPC before that. All that is corruption. And so he, he has no moral authority to come up and talk about corruption. And indeed, uh, even uh, the former IGG, Irene Muriagonja, said that, you know, every time I come after the thieves, I find them hiding behind the, the back of the president. So that is the problem. And so we cannot fight corruption if we do not actually change uh, the, the political system, if we do not change, if we do not address the governance question. What we need to understand is that uh, corruption affects societies in ways that you cannot understand uh, because it is why uh, children will not go to school. It is why there, there, no, there are no hospitals, there are no drugs in the existent ones. It is uh, why uh, public officials are not paid on time and, and they're not paid well. It is why all these problems we are talking about, you're talking about the question of public debt. Our country is uh, heavily, heavily indebted. But one of the questions is, what does this money do? And if you look at uh, what almost every World Bank project in Uganda has been riddled by massive allegations of corruption. And of course, uh, the, the cover-ups that have gone on, etc. etc. So, Genome 7 and his regime are getting huge loans, which uh, myself, yourself, your children, and your children's children will have to pay. But this money is not even going into uh, the sectors that should make sure that that money is paid. But that money is uh, embezzled, and then uh, people have to uh, invest these monies abroad, etc. etc. So that is, uh, I think, the crisis our country faces. And so I think that the point I'm making is that you cannot talk about economic independence without talking about political independence. That our country must, first of all, be liberated politically. We get independence. Leaders are held accountable. And then at that point, we have institutions. For example, you can, you can see the office of the IGG, just like the Human Rights Commission. The IGG herself was a subject of a corruption investigation by Kosase a, a few months back. You remember that? So it's a joke. Uh, all these institutions have been turned into uh, a joke. They are just there to tick the box. But if we, we have regained our freedom as the people of Uganda, we'll be able to have proper institutions that can uh, ensure there's accountability, that the Auditor General's reports are followed through, that there's, uh, there's uh, uh, you know, value for money, and that if we are to get loans to borrow funds, those funds are going to go into sectors that improve the lives of the people of Uganda. Right. Uh, sovereignty, corruption, public debt, foreign loans and foreign aid, that was related to questions around regionalism, where Uganda is a big brother bully, bullying Congo DRC, having UPDF soldiers there, stealing gold, stealing timber, poo-pooing our soldiers in Somali, poo-pooing our soldiers in Sudan, poo-pooing our soldiers all over the region. And the regional question was going to be addressed to Minister Nobat Mawa, who's not here. I will now turn to Dr. Chisa Vesige and uh, relate the questions of sovereignty and our role in the region of East Africa to your work and training and expertise as a military person. Dr. Chiza Besige, you're a retired military man who rose up the ranks. In what ways can we civilians, non-military Ugandans, make the UPDF an army that protects Ugandans instead of protecting the interests and lives of specific individuals in the executive in Uganda? How can we civilians who have no guns make the UPDF army work in our interests over and above the interests of one man and his family? As you're addressing us, I will upload five people at a time to be speakers. If anyone is rude as Dr. Chiza Vesige is speaking, I will mute you and drop you immediately. Dr. Chiza Vesige, you're welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, unfortunately, it was not clear to me how long uh, we would be going on in this space. I thought we would be done by 10 p.m., which it is uh, in Kampala here. It's 22 hours. Uh, Just very quickly to respond to that question, at 10 p.m., if you have to leave, you're welcome to leave. The space is always yes, available. Yeah. Okay, yes, I'm saying, the yeah. last contribution, but the space will continue, and the people who have been asking for the microphone can take 
the microphone and speak even when you're not present. Is that okay? Very well, very well. thank you very much. Now, sovereignty is, of course, uh, precisely what uh, we were discussing for most of uh, the engagement today uh, about people having power, sovereign power within their uh, within the, 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 the territory that is called Uganda. It is the sovereignty that we don't have. Because as I pointed out at the beginning, we didn't even form the country Uganda. It was formed by foreigners. Uh, we were different nations. We did not uh, agree that we should become Uganda. We were forced to become Uganda. And it's a reality that we have had to live with. Uh, and that force which created Uganda was the sovereign. So the sovereign of Uganda was the Queen of England. Since then, the successors of the Queen of England, who are the commanders of the forces of, that control the country, Uganda, have remained the sovereign. So today, Mr. Museveni is the sovereign. He is the sovereign of Uganda, not the people of Uganda. So what the people of Uganda must fight for is their sovereignty, the power of the people to decide. This is what I tried to explain at the beginning, which they don't have now. So the sovereign who decides what to do uh, is the controller of the forces. He's not just the commander of the forces, the commander-in-chief of the forces, but he, he owns the country. And that's why he even talks about his army, his oil, his, uh, uh, the, his land. It's, 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 he is sovereign. And uh, part of all sovereigns, especially sovereigns of old, is to expand their sovereignty. And I dare say that indeed, one of Museven's ambitions is to expand his sovereign influence to expand his sovereign influence over neighboring countries. He's been talking about uh, widening the market of East Africa. His idea of widening the market of East Africa is not uh, certainly the same, I, 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 I dare say. It's not the same as uh, those who think of negotiation through the East African community, the common markets, I don't know these, the uh, common uh, currency, the common whatever. His idea of expanding the market is expanding his sovereign influence. In other words, projecting his power, his sovereign power, beyond what is Uganda's borders. And to a certain extent, he has uh, uh, done well in that sphere. He clearly projected his influence in the Sudan, and the, uh, what is now the southern Sudan, in Congo. That is why we are in Congo. Uh, I hope that uh, uh, the, the fears that uh, some have been expressing that Congo may also break into eastern Congo and western Congo and the eastern Congo may get under his influence is uh, it does not come to uh, to reality you ha you have seen the conflict with Rwanda because he has in he indeed without doubt intended to exercise his sovereignty to expand his sovereign influence over Rwanda and and so on and so forth so the question you ask is how do we regain sovereignty and that is the bottom line of uh, uh, the struggle that the people of Uganda, the challenge of the people of Uganda is to regain their sovereignty. And we will not do so unless we subordinate the forces that, con that took away our sovereignty, that we defeat them and subordinate them. The reason they took away our sovereignty is that they defeated us and subordinated us. To regain our sovereignty, we must defeat those who captured our country and we must subordinate them. So it's a struggle. That's why it's a struggle. It's a fight. We must fight for our sovereignty. It will not be granted. Just like we uh, fought against the, the, the colonial administration, we resisted, we disobeyed, we uh, defied the power of the, uh, of, of the colonial government. Uh, and of course, at that time, many other countries were doing the same until the colonial powers felt that it was no longer sustainable and granted independence. We must fight. It's not, this is why it's critical for Ugandans to realize that we shall not regain sovereignty by going to the fake elections that Mr. Museveni organizes and hoping that he will grant us a piece of paper to put in a box he's holding, that he's going to count, that he's going.